In today's show, we are talking NBA Draft Prospects with Sam from the Draft Dummies and the Locked On NBA Draft Podcast. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Spotify Green Room. Download the Spotify Green Room app and find one of our Locked On rooms. We're here to talk about the NBA Draft Last couple of days, you've seen a bunch of prospects we've gone through. We're going to go through a bunch more today. And to do that, I am joined by one of the hosts of the Locked On NBA Draft podcast, one and a half of the Draft Dummies, Sam Ferris is here. Sam, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thank you again so much for having me on. Always excited to talk NBA Draft. Let's let's get stuck into it straight away because the first player we're going to talk about is a guy that is undoubtedly going in the top four possibly going in the top two, likely going in the top three, however you want to phrase it, and that is Evan Mobley out of USC. Now, I'll just start this question to you here, Sam. Is Evan Mobley, and is he closer to an Anthony Davis level of prospect or a James Wiseman level of prospect? Definitely to an Anthony Davis from my perspective. I was a bit lower, actually. If you remember last year when we came on, Cody and I talked about being a bit lower on Wiseman and just apart from the physical tools, it comes down to a lot of just the basketball sense, the basketball feel and the skill level that frankly Mobley is just a lot closer to Anthony Davis than to kind of the lower end of the James Wiseman there. Anthony Davis, we know him as a, as a, as a big man now who, who can step out and space the floor a little bit, but he wasn't really known for that in college or his first couple of years. He, Mobley here you know, hit half a three a game, he had a 62 true shooting. Has he got that ability to you know, maybe become a one and a half threes per game sort of a player? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, a lot of the bigs, when you see them in high school and in college, especially when they're just there for one year, a lot of the times they just don't get that opportunity to work on and develop that shot. But just in terms of the talent level and the skill level, I think he's certainly going to get there. And there are a lot of stats that just absolutely love Evan Mobley. One that sticks out to me is that if you look at all of the freshmen that have played college basketball since 2008, only three bigs have both registered an offensive and defensive box plus minus over five. And that is Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Davis, and Evan Mobley. So when you're talking about a big, both with that offensive skill level and that level of defensive ability, really those are that's kind of the level of big that you're talking about. So, you know, when when we talk about what Mobley can do, um, you know, we, there's the potential there for the shooting. You know, offensively, his game is is pretty strong, but is he a better offensive pl- prospect or a defensive prospect? Um, that's a tough question. I mean, he's so good at both. It, it's, it's nitpicking or it's really close between the two. I would go... I'd go offensive just because centers generally are expected to be very good defensively, and I think he will be. I think at his peak, he could be potentially a top five guy in terms of defensive player of the year. But I think we do toss around the word unicorn too often, but Mobley is a guy that you could throw in that category in terms of the ability to handle, the ability to shoot, create and make his own, you know, difficult shots. He has the skill set really that he could develop almost into a wing offensively. And to me, that's a bit more unique and just a bit more valuable than, you know, the average than what, you know, your average NBA center will provide offensively. So I love him on both sides of the ball, maybe slightly better offensive prospect in my opinion. What's his passing like? I think it's good. He reads the floor well. Uh, He would often get double teamed at USC and he made quick decisions. 
you know, he's not certainly not a Jokic or near that level. I don't think he projects to quite be that, but I certainly could see him being one of the five to 10 best passing bigs in the league. And part of that comes with his movement skills and his ability to create advantages at his size. Uh, you know, we see a lot of the best passers in the NBA are these guys with that size. And so he has those tools where I think that's going to continue to develop down the road. Would you say that he is at a level or could get to a level like a Bam at a bio or Carl Anthony Towns, Yusuf Nurkic style passer? Yeah, definitely. I think he can be in that class. So to, is he a clear number two for you? Is he higher? Is he lower? Like where, where do you have him sitting in the draft? So the way I have my big board laid out is I do have Cade in a tier of his own at number one. Then I have both Jalen Green and Jalen Suggs and Evan Mobley in that second tier. And to me, those guys are very interchangeable. I tend to prefer Jalen Green just very slightly because I value kind of the shot creation on the perimeter. And I think he is, I wouldn't say a generational prospect in terms of a shot creator on the perimeter, but he's very, very good. And I think we've seen in the playoffs just how important those guys are. So if you're asking me, it's splitting hairs. It's like 51 to 49% Jalen Green over Mobley. I think they're both fantastic prospects. I think he's also going to be a really good fantasy option for those of you looking dynasty leagues. His ability to score, rebound, pass, block shots, hit threes, have good percentages. Like You can't ask for anything more in a prospect. And that's why you bring up Towns and bring up Davis because we know that they're top four, top five fantasy guys and Mobley can I think end up developing into a player like that. Like that's obviously a huge, huge part of you know, a really successful long-term dynasty situation. Guys, this episode is brought to you by Spotify Greenroom. Greenroom is the first social audio platform made for sports fans. The app is free to download. And once you're in, you can talk with fans, athletes, insiders in real time about your favorite team or sport. Greenroom is the perfect place to start or join conversations about the NBA or your favorite sport. And you'll find fans just like you in there for watch parties, debates, post-game breakdowns, and of course, reacting to big news or rumors. You can find plenty of locked on hosts in there as well. You even see me pop in there from time to time. So go download the free Spotify Greenroom app now, available on all iOS devices devices and be sure to create a profile link your twitter and join the nba group for the latest league updates i know you'll find tons of incredible rooms in there around your favorite teams and leagues download the spotify green room app today spotify green room is changing the way that we talk sports sam let's talk some of those sports balls right now next player another big man we're going to go to an international player and that is usman garuba and if you don't know who Usman, I know you know who he is, but listeners, if you don't know who Usman Garuba is, a, uh, a center out of Spain, played for Real Madrid. He's still obviously really young, just 19 years of age. He's not particularly tall. They're listing him as 6'8", which is you know, really small as a center. I'd say he's probably a little bit bigger than that. And the numbers don't scream at you. You have 4.7 points, 4.6 rebounds. They're not particularly good. 47% from the field, 66 from the line. Not good. 15 usage, also not good. Half a block. Not good. So when people are looking at those numbers, what context do they need to put into that? Because Garuba's a guy who, who's almost definitely going to go into the first round. So what are these numbers not telling us about the player that he is? Yeah, exactly. You have to understand the context behind these numbers. And the context here is that Usman Garuba plays for Real Madrid, which is one of the you know five to 10 best teams in the world outside of the NBA. Um, and to be able to contribute to a team that good, including in their playoffs, and he, he's doing that at 18, 19, and he's done that going back a few years now. So when you look at the numbers, you have to realize that this isn't college basketball, this isn't the G League, and he's not being given the keys to the offense or anything like that. He's asked to fit into a role on already a very good professional team, and he's done that very well. Yeah, so yeah, he's 18 years of age, defending at a high level in the second best league in the world. Yeah, he starting started half their games, came off the bench for half the games as well uh, for Real Madrid, and they just don't need him to do anything offensively. But Sam, I'm pretty sure you'd agree that yeah, defensively he held up at a really high level uh, in that in that high level basketball at 18. Like that, that's an impressive feat. Yeah, it is. And I, I like the transition here from Mobley to Garuba because I do tend to think that Evan Mobley might have the highest defensive ceiling in this class. But if you're to ask me right now who is the best defender, 
I would say that Usman Garuba is the most ready to contribute and be a positive defensive player for an NBA team from day one. And you talked about the physical measurements. What's interesting to me is the most, the closest in terms of just the physical measurements to him is actually Paul Millsap. And I think that is a lot like the type of defensive role that you could see from Usman Garuba. Well, that's what I was going to ask you next. Like when you talk about him being an elite defender, is it because he's a great rim protector? Is it because he's got an ability to switch? To, is he an ability to play in passing lanes? Is it all of those things? Yeah, it's all those things. You hope that he can kind of plug a lot of different holes like Millsap has done over the course of his career. And on top of the tools, on top of the athleticism that he has, he's been trained at Real Madrid again from a young age. He's a guy that, you know, you look at a lot of young guys that play AAU or play just one year of college and that feel that instinct and that knowledge of when and where to be and how to rotate isn't quite there for a lot of guys. Well, it's really there for Garuba. From a young age, he's been trained, and he knows that to get on the floor for Real, Real Madrid, he has to be there defensively. And so I love that about him, and I think that he can be a fantastic defensive player, hopefully similar to, to Paul Millsap in the NBA. What about his offense? Because obviously, yeah, as a big man, 47% shooting is not a good number. He hit 32% of his threes, attempted one and a half a game, which is a decent amount in 17 minutes a year for a for a center. Um, is there shooting upside there? Can he do anything more than just be a energy play finisher on offense? Yeah, so again, the context... At Real Madrid, he was almost exclusively parked in the corner, playing more of the four. So he was mostly taking corner threes as a product of the offense and then just kind of whatever he could get in transition or just, you know, some dirty work baskets. So I wouldn't read too much into those numbers. But yeah, the question with him is what exactly and how much will he provide offensively? I do tend to believe that the just the standstill catch-and-shoot jumper will be good enough. Again, probably similar to what Paul Millsap was able to do in terms of just the catch and shoot. But Paul Millsap obviously was more than that offensively. And that's the question, just to what level can Garuba get? And will he ask to be, you know, will he ask to be doing more than that offensively uh, is the question. And again, going back to the height, he's like 6'8". So will he play the four? Will he play the five? I tend to view him more as kind of a four next to another traditional center. All right, so this year's draft class is generally considered to be significantly stronger than last season's draft class. But if you were to compare Garuba, who's probably going to be drafted in the teens, in that, we'll say, 11 to 16 range, most likely. Yeah, how does he compare to two big men who went in the top six last year? James Wiseman and Yeka Okongwu. Like, where does Garuba fit? with those guys? Are they both significantly better prospects than Garuba? I think Garuba is a better prospect again than Wiseman. But again, I was a bit lower on Wiseman and still am after his rookie year. Uh, I did prefer Okongwu a bit as a prospect and he was considered to be a top five guy and really went that high on draft night. So yeah, I'd slot him in there between the two of Okongwu and Wiseman pretty comfortably. Yeah, that's probably how I'd have it as well. Have Garuba, uh, sorry, Okongwu, Garuba, and then uh, and then Wiseman. I was pretty high on Okongwu. We saw, we've seen Okongwu play at a pretty high level in these playoffs, and uh, you can just see that trajectory moving forward to him to being a starter in a, in a couple of years' time. But let's go on to the next guy where there is, um, I guess, consternation about this player. Uh, I'll just tell you who it is right now because it is Jonathan Kaminga, who is... Um, yeah, this draft is often stated as being a five-player draft, and Kaminga is almost universally that fifth player. I am not as convinced that there is this five-player tier. And as you've said before, you've got sort of four players at the top, and they're the same four that I have. Yeah, Kaminga uh, played with the G League Ignite last season, and I'm just going to put his numbers up on the screen. The, the shooting numbers are horrendous. like Under 50% true shooting, 39 from the field, 62 from the line. He's got that Typical wing body that you want, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, forward, long arms. He's young, he's 18, he's got offensive pop. He's been well um, yeah, hyped up for years. But it didn't really happen from a shooting perspective. So what are you viewing with Kaminga? Tell me, is he clear fifth to you in this class? Are you are you down on him? Are you just banking on, hey, if a forward hits and he's got the measurables and he's got the ability, like that's that's a no-brainer pick? 
Yeah, so Josh and I did not talk about our notes and our kind of personal boards before this, nope. but it sounds like we are kind of in the same boat here. He, to me, isn't the fifth best prospect in this class. And so I am on the lower end in terms of just projecting his future in the NBA. Um, so yeah, he's probably actually the guy that I might be lowest on in this draft, just compared to consensus and compared to the mainstream mocks and boards that you might see, whether it's ESPN or The Athletic. Um, I'm not sure exactly where you are on him, Josh, but I'm not comparing him at all in terms of a prospect to James Wiseman, but in terms of just, he looks to me more like an athlete playing basketball than a basketball player playing basketball. And so when I say that, I mean, to me, he comes off a bit robotic at times, both in his movement as well as in the decision-making where a lot of it can look pre-programmed. And just though he is a very good athlete, it's a bit robotic to me. And so actually the comp that I've used is Harrison Barnes, but with a little bit less touch. So I don't know how people would exactly value that, but to me, he's actually outside of my top 10. And like I said, I'm just a bit lower on him than the consensus. Interesting. So the way I do my process is on lottery night, I did my first mock draft and I did have him at number five, but in a couple of days time, I'm doing mock draft number two and I can t- I haven't finalized it, but I can tell you now he's already dropped uh, multiple spots uh, on that mock draft as I dig into things and read more stuff. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm down on him. I just, I, I know shooting can develop and people say, well, Kawhi Leonard didn't shoot, but that's, that's the outlier. That's the you know, 1% one first percentile outcome of a guy turning from this defensive stopper who couldn't play offense into this elite offensive player. Like that, that is just not the expectation that you should have. And if you go into every draft going, well, he's a big wing and maybe he turns into Kawhi, then you're just going to be disappointed. So I am not, yeah, I'm, I'm not that high on where Kaminga sits, but he's a, again, a name that I've heard for multiple years. And I go, oh, I can't wait till Jonathan Kaminga gets in the draft. Like when he was 15, like I'm sure you would have been yeah. the same, like hearing about this guy, like, okay, all right, let's, let's get excited. And then he reclassified to get into this draft class. And it just was, you're right, It just the, the feel wasn't there. The shot selection w- was weird for him. This is not to say that the, he can't develop into something good because, of, of course, he can. But yeah, you, you see red flags that in the past, those sort of red flags have not led to necessarily good outcomes for players, which yeah, leads to concern. But you know, he averaged 16 points for the G League. He had seven rebounds. He almost blocked a shot a game. He had a steal per game. So some of those numbers are okay. But if you look at, yeah, you know, some of the the advanced numbers for him, they're just nowhere near uh, the level I think that you, you would want someone to be if you are committing that fifth pick. And if you are the magic at pick number five who already has an issue with perimeter shooting and just get, getting these lengthy guys who you hope develop something, then I'm not sure that he's going to be the right selection for you uh, there. That's just an, another another player that you can't rely on to space the floor. And I, I think that's going to be a considerable worry uh, for him and for the Magic if they do go there. But Sam, I'll tell you what isn't a worry, and that is if you are looking to choose a healthy yet delicious protein bar. Built Bar is the protein bar that you want. Have you? Uh, what's your favorite Built Bar? Uh, I like, I'm a berry guy, so I tend to go with all the different berry selections, but I'm also a chocolate guy. The fact that they're 100% covered in chocolate is the reason that I, I'm a big Built Bar guy myself. Yeah, look, their raspberry flavor one is really good. They also have the uh, one of my favorites. They don't have it at the moment. Is the white chocolate raspberry cheesecake? That's a that's a goat bar. But they don't have that one anymore. But they bring limited time flavors in all the time. And these bars not only are delicious and taste like a treat, they're also healthy. They're good for you. Low calorie. Most flavors have 17 grams of protein, but just 130 calories and four grams of sugar with just four grams of net carbs. And if you don't know what your favorite flavor is, like me and Sam, we've got our flavors at the moment. You can buy a mixed box. 18 bars, nine flavors, two of each flavor. So you can try all of the flavors and see exactly which one is yours. So go to builtbar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. That is LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, and you'll get 15% off your first order. The promo code is LOCKED15 for 15% off at builtbar.com. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. By the time you listen to this, the NBA Finals, they might be over. I don't know. The Stanley Cup Finals will be over, but baseball is still going, and you can track all of that action at Bet Online. Before that next pitch, head over to Bet Online on your laptop or mobile device and check out all of the great sporting news, sign-up bonuses, and contest information. Don't sit on the sidelines anymore, as this is your chance to get into the game as teams prep for their runs to the playoffs. Use our promo code Locked On and head to the website, sign up today, and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online are your online sportsbook experts. 
All right, next player for us to talk about. And this is a guy who just, inst- and this is 100% petty, but it instinctively just, his name annoys me because it shouldn't be Book Night. Like, it, it just shouldn't be. It, it, it should be Boo Night. Like, K N I G H T is night. That's that's a it just it annoys me and I don't, and I know that I will make that mistake. So I was instinctively look at it as boo night. But we're talking about James Book Night here from um, uh, University of Connecticut. I put his numbers up on the screen. If I was to say that he is a pure scorer, um, how much pushback would you? Is that that's what he's a scorer. That's his role. Is there any pushback on that? No. That's absolutely the phrase that I would use to describe him. He is just a bucket getter, and he's been that through two years at the University of Connecticut. And every year in the draft, we see guys kind of towards the end of the process really rise up boards. And lately, it seems like James Booknight might be that guy. I've seen people now saying that he could go six or seven in this draft. And I think a couple of weeks ago, he was more kind of in the middle of the team. So seems to be one of those risers that you know happens every year leading up to the draft wait six or seven you're seeing people push him into that seems uh that seems rather rather high like okay so my stereotypical player for this sort of you know archetype i guess in the nba at the moment is jordan clarkson who goes out there takes every shot you know every shot that he can get his hands on and doesn't do a huge amount else is that worth pick six or seven yeah, well, for a start off, do you think that that's the sort of role that the yeah, book knight can aspire to? And is that worth pick six or seven in a draft? I, I'm, I'm not sure it is, but yeah, how do you compare his game to, say, what Clarkson's doing at the moment? Yeah, so you hit the nail on the head because first, before we get into their games, uh, Jordan Clarkson is one of the closest physical comparisons for book knight. So though he is a two, he's kind of on the smaller end, both in terms of his height and standing reach, which is an ideal and yeah, he's a bucket getter. I, I do think he is a better defender, especially at this age than Clarkson. I think he actually plays pretty tough and pretty hard there. So especially compared to the other shooting guards in this class, I think he, he projects better there. But no, I, I definitely don't have him in the six to seven range. I'm more in the middle of the teens. Um, there's just been a lot of noise lately about his kind of private workouts that he's been doing and how the jump shot has come along. Um, So I hate to be the one kind of throwing water on all of this, but if you actually go look at the numbers, shot 29% from three of last year, but it gets even worse because, you know, a lot of times people will argue, you know, his role was just too much. And if we scale it back, if he's just taking more catch and shoot shots, then you're gonna see that efficiency go up. Well, he actually was the single worst catch and shoot jump shooter in all of college basketball last year. Again, tiny, tiny sample. He only shot one of 15 on straight, straight catch and shoot jump shots. So what I'm saying here is that, you know, we shouldn't just put all of our eggs in the basket of the numbers. We shouldn't put all our eggs in the basket of the video, but a lot goes into projecting jump shots and he just doesn't have a huge sample size yet. But I do think his game is going to hinge a lot on whether he's able to shoot the ball well. Because like you've said, we've seen from Clarkson, you know, going back a couple years, he just wasn't that valuable. This year, he he shot the ball a lot better. And I still don't really value him that much. But his value certainly did go up one one sixth man of the year this year. So I I just think that jump shot is going to be a big swing still for him. But even if it does hit, I, I still don't view him as the sixth or seventh best prospect in this class. And he's about to turn 21 as well. So he's not particularly young, especially when you've got, you know, there are guys who are going to be 18 for you know, the first three months of the season. So he's a bit older there. Um, what's his, uh, any any ability to be a passer, a secondary you know, initiator, a pick and roll guy? Is there any ability in, in that sort of area for him? I mean, I'm never going to discount it. I mean, there's guys that, kind of prove us wrong there and can develop that but there just aren't that many guys that you really trust with the ball in their hands too often in the, in the NBA so yeah I think he can dribble he can pass a bit but I view him more again as kind of a Jordan Clarkson ish player where he's a bucket getter he's a natural scorer that's what he looks to do uh, in the film in college he would miss reads miss passes that were there and so He's definitely not the guy from this class that I would project as, 
a lead ball handler or a great passer uh, at the next level. Let's go on to the next player, and that is Terrence Shannon Jr. Bring his numbers up from uh, from Texas Tech. Now, the history of Texas Tech players in the NBA over the last couple of years has not been particularly good. Uh, Zaire Smith, uh, Jarrett Culver, uh, Jamias Ramsey last season. Um, Shannon, 6'6", sort of wing player. He's 20 years of age, averaged 13 points per game. 25 usage, had a 56 true shooting. I don't know, it's more of a second round player, I would suspect, but I'm seeing his name you know, crop up a little bit more towards the end of that first round area. You know, what sort of a player is Shannon? Is he just that, to me, he feels more like that stereotypical, again, wing scorer sort of guy who, who has some uh, lacking, lacking skills in other areas? Yeah, uh, I would agree. I would say in terms of kind of high level comp would be Kelly Oubre, but not quite the length. Uh, he, again, very fast, very athletic at six foot six, a kid that grew up playing football. So he's not afraid of the competition or the contact. He's a physical guy, has those tools. Uh, the shooting has improved year over year quite a bit. It went up 10% from three this year, and he is a good free throw shooter. But is that small sample size or is that actual improvement? I don't know. Um, like most left-handed guys, he's very left-handed, really only uses his left hand. So, yeah, I think he can be a good defender. He's certainly a good athlete, but how much else does he provide? I'm not sure. I'm with you there, Josh. I do view him as more of either a very late first-round pick or a second-round guy to me. So yeah, the shooting is, is is for so many of these guys. It's going to be that that swing skill. Um, the athleticism for him, for Shannon though is really high, and I think that's something that the teams will be enamored by. But you know, athleticism only gets you so far if you can't actually shoot or can't actually play. What's his defensive ability like? Yeah, again, when you look at the defensive side of the ball, there aren't any great metrics still to measure these guys, and these guys are still so young that the first thing you do have to look at is the physical tools. He definitely checks that box. I also will say that he does have good hands. You'll see him kind of rip guys going in for layups. And he covers, you know, going along with the physical tools, covers a ton of ground. So he can make up, you know, if he gets beat or just rotating in their defensive schemes, he can make up a lot of ground and make plays at the rim. So, I mean, he should project to be a good defender. He's got the tools. But this is kind of a story that, like you said, we see with a lot of prospects. So what skill level really develops and how well does he shoot will kind of determine his future in the NBA. Last guy we're going to talk about in today's show, another young guard slash wingy sort of player, and that is Josh Primo from Alabama, six foot six. Now he is one of the guys I'm talking about really, really young. He doesn't turn 19 until Christmas Eve, in fact. So really young, only played 22 minutes a night this season for Alabama. Averaged eight points. He shot 38% from three on almost four attempts per game. Not much in terms of you know assist numbers or rebound numbers or defensive numbers. But I guess that's an encouraging start, shooting 38% from deep as a young player who started a little bit over half of his games. Again, probably more of a second a second round type of player. But is it just the, the youth and the athleticism and the size that's intriguing people? What are your thoughts on Primo? Yeah, so first context, like you said, he was 17 when the season started. So to even play in the uh, SEC at that young of an age is impressive, especially to play for Alabama, who is a very, very good team this year. Uh, so I think the pitch with Josh Primo is that it's like buying a stock early where you're hoping that, you know, if he had gone back to college, that next year maybe he would have improved a lot. And all of a sudden he's a guy that shoots into the first round so basically, you're getting him early. You put him in your G League development system and see what you get. Uh, but in terms of on the court, the thing that I like the most is the frame is good. I think he measured six foot five in shoes at the combine. But I really like his jump shot. And like you said, and we've seen with a ton of these prospects going through this list and in past years, the swing skill with so many guys is the jumper. And I really like it from Primo. Uh, it's pretty rare to find guys that young shoot the ball pretty well uh, the numbers were good and i think his form is very very good he's a, got great preparation on his jump shot and he can hit it both off the dribble and off the catch 
So he's got the physical tools, though. He's not really as great of an athlete as you might think, kind of looking at his frame. I think he's more of kind of a combo guard shooting type of prospect where we kind of see what his frame and his game look like after maybe a year, year and a half in the G League. Yeah, he does feel like he's more of a developmental sort of prospect that you're going to give that little bit of time to. But you know, comparing him to the guy that we just talked about previously, Terrence Shannon Jr., would you have Primo ahead of him? Yeah, I think I would just because it's more difficult to find guys with that shooting projection from a young age. And I just think that kind of if he does hit and the frame does improve, you know, starting from such a young age, that, you know, if he hits kind of an upper end outcome in terms of his projection, that that'll probably be a little bit more valuable than Terrence Shannon. Uh, but for me, Primo is very late first round or end of the or beginning of the second round. So I have him probably maybe a tier or so ahead of Terrence Shannon. Yeah, I think that's sort of where I'll settle on, on Primo in terms of him versus Terrence Shannon. But Still go, still a lot of water to go under the bridge, but that'll do it for today's show. We'll be back uh, tomorrow, me and Sam, to, to cover some more prospects. Uh, Sam, tell people where they can find you on Twitter um, and uh, the work that you do. Yeah, you can find us at Draft Dummies on Twitter. I put a lot of time in there. I, I like to post clips. I like to post stats and my thoughts. And I'm doing a lot of work there, especially as we lead up and gear up to the draft this is kind of what we work for year round and of course you can find our show we are the locked on nba draft show cody and i uh host one day a week on wednesdays but the other hosts are also awesome so every day we're putting out new NBA draft content and it's a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, uh, like yeah, last the, the guest from the last two days, Rafael Barlow, he hosts those days. You know, Sam Cody, they host as well. We've got Richard who's going to come up next week on the show hosting the Locked On NBA Draft podcast. So make sure you're checking that out. But also, uh, or Sam, actually, thank you for for jumping in today. And again, we'll, we'll chat to you for tomorrow's show. But guys, make sure you are following this podcast: Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. While on YouTube, hit the uh, hit the old subscribe down there. Flick my bell, thumb me up, leave a comment down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.